everyone, and welcome to the show. This is episode number 84 of Pop Culturally Deprived, and today we're going to be talking about Much Ado About Nothing on your I Wish My Horse Had the Speed of Your Tongue podcast. I'm Mandy Kay. And I'm Matthew Bose. Today, we're thrilled to be joined by Kim Metzger, who hosts the Service Desk podcast and is a player on the D&D Real Play podcast, Beholder's Eye. Kim, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. I love your show. It's great to be on it. Yay! Yay! <laughs> no, we're thrilled to have you here. Um, much Ado was very much your choice. Yes. Uh, but we ended up having quite a long conversation about different versions of it. Um, can you tell us a bit your background with Much Ado, why this was the one you picked out so much? It is my absolute favorite Shakespearean play, and there are so many fantastic adaptations of it. Um, I also really enjoy just like reading it because there's so much mm. fun, witty banter. And so to see how different productions, you know, come up with how to split that banter and how to play it. Some go a bit darker, some go a bit lighter. I particularly like this instance because it's really light and I really love the interplay between David Tennant and Catherine Tate. Yeah, it really does lend something and particularly I think because of their history. Everything they do together is absolutely fantastic. Like, she's one of my favorite companions on Doctor Who as well, just because mm-hmm. of their banter. <laughs> so, Mandy, this is new to you, I think. I think you've never seen, read, studied Much Ado. Correct. I didn't even know the plot of Much Ado until yesterday. Okay. <laughs> uh, how come? Oh, my God. Shakespeare is so intimidating. And and so if it's not something that I read in school or became familiar with in school, be it high school or college, then it was just something that I kind of shied away from because reading Shakespeare, just the text, is difficult on your own, to me anyway, just because there, there are so many different inflections and tones and puns and wordplay that if you don't understand – you're not going to understand what the play is about and what they're trying to tell you. And, and so I've really just focused on the stuff that was already familiar to me. Like I love Hamlet. I've seen Hamlet probably 15 times. I've seen all of the adaptations of it. Um, Anytime that I see the Benedict Cumberbatch version of Hamlet, I am always going to go see it. Like I will drop everything to go see it because it's so amazing. (laughs) So, I mean, like, I like Shakespeare a lot, but I'm afraid to go to Shakespeare by myself. Like, I kind of need some hand-holding through it. Well, I'm glad I was okay. able to hold your hand to this one. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I love Much Ado. It is, it, like you, Kim, I think it is wonderful and one of the best there is. And, and I've, I've had to sit down and actually, like, write out because I knew I'd studied it at school. Sure. But I couldn't remember when, because we basically do one a year, all through education. Um, so I was like, right, I know I did Hamlet then, I did Macbeth then, then I did The Tempest, and I, I think I did it my first year at uh, Sixth Form College. Interesting, you did The Tempest. Huh. Yeah, I think we, I think I did that my second year of Sixth Form College. <laughs> Fascinating. Yeah, I was a British lit buff. Um, I was actually an English major in college, so hmm. that's part of where all of my Shakespearean love came from. Well, see, that makes it even worse because I was also an English major in college. (laughs) And I did take one semester of Shakespeare. But in that semester, we did Romeo and Juliet. We did Hamlet. We did Macbeth. You know, it was like intro Shakespeare level stuff. I think the second semester would have gone a little bit deeper, but I didn't have to take it. And um, I was focusing on other things. So I didn't. but yeah, so I, I think I've probably done Romeo and Juliet like no less than four times just in school, um, oh, as well as Hamlet. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's really bad. <laughs> it's definitely not as awesome as I used to think it was. Ugh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, so I honestly, I'm trying to think if I've, if I'm familiar with any of the other plays besides those three. Like those are the big three. Um, I'm slightly more familiar with Twelfth Night just because of the 10 Things I Hate About You adaptation. Oh, yeah. 
Um, but I've never read it. Oh. So, yeah. Well. I am a failure as an English major. That's <laughs> what we're learning here. <laughs> <laughs> you are not a failure, Mandy. You just studied yeah. other Part things. Part of the point of the podcast, opening the world up. It's great. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Okay, so a bit of history for everyone at home. Uh, Much Ado About Nothing is a comedy written by William Shakespeare. If you hadn't picked up from all the conversation we just had. (laughs) Um, It was written at the end of the 16th century. It is considered one of his best plays and has been adapted into several movies set across different eras, languages and countries. Today, we are going to be discussing the 2011 production. It was staged in London's West End at the Whit- Wyndham's Theatre. The production starred David Tennant and Catherine Tate as Benedict and Beatrice, and was directed by Josie Rourke. This production was filmed and is available via the website at Digital Theatre. And a quick aside, Mandy, you remember you came to London? Yes. And we walked from having fish and chips through to Leicester Square, mm-hmm. and we went down that alley that had all the signs for theatres and productions that were on. Yes. That was Wyndham's Theatre that we walked past. Oh, cool. Which I hadn't tweaked at the time. It was the same thing. But I was like, right, I can. I think I can point that out. <laughs> yes, I remember. Now, had this been uh, playing uh, with David Tennant and Catherine Tate, um, we would have like moved heaven and earth to make sure I could have seen it while I was there. <laughs> but alas, it's not 2011 anymore. It is not. That is very true. <laughs> Do you want to give us a brief synopsis if anyone else isn't aware of uh, the plot? Uh, sure, except I think you guys are probably want to give a little bit more detail beyond my brief synopsis, because this is basically a sitcom where everybody misunderstands everybody else about everything, but especially love. <laughs> well, I guess that works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I, I, I kept thinking. Wow, this is like the first sitcom ever while we were while I was watching it. Basically, um, yeah. And and so that's that's what I got out of it. And it is literally called Much Ado About Nothing. <laughs> yes. He's yes. he's saying from the very beginning, there's a bit of silliness about to come, guys. Yeah. <laughs> and nothing could actually also be um, taken as the word noting because, you know, Shakespearean English and all that. And so the idea is that you are noting one another, but not necessarily understanding what's going on. Mm-hmm. So. No, also noting in the eavesdropping and gossiping. Yes, that is and well. and no thing as a slang for women. Really, mm. that I did not know. Because they have no thing. It's very clever. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Okay. So we always like to say how everyone watched the film. Um, I'm going to assume we all rented it from the website you can rent it from, right? Yes, it is literally the only place that you can watch this version. Well, fun story. So when mm. I first learned of Catherine Tate and David Tennant being in this, this was after I had I had like just finished watching all of the Doctor Who up to that point. And okay. so this was probably 2013-ish. Um, I was like chatting somewhere. I don't even remember. And somebody was like, oh, have you seen this version of Much Ado About Nothing? And I was like, What? This exists in the world and I have not seen it? What is wrong with me? And then I went on an epic quest to go find it. And I was like, it's not on Netflix. It's not on Amazon. I can't buy it on like DVD or something. Where can I get this? And then somebody was finally like, oh, digital theater. Go go to that site. And at that time, the site, like you had to download a special player and like it barely worked on my computer, but it was oh. glorious anyway. <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm so glad that there was somebody who had the foresight to create a video version of this stage play and make it available because that doesn't happen very often. Right. And, and for it to still be available, it's just mm. awesome. That, that was the thing that surprised me most. And, and then you look at Digital Theatre's uh, catalog and they have a lot of stuff on there. Like It's a good service. So I didn't even look at anything else they were offering because I was just like, <laughs> I have to watch Much Ado. David Tennant, heart eyes, done. <laughs> Basically. Basically. <yes. laughs> yeah. Uh, we will make sure to drop the link to where you can rent it in the show notes. So if anyone's listening to us and wanting to find it, click that link after you've listened to us. Or before you've listened to us so you can join in. Whichever suits you. <laughs> just do it. I'm going to ask the stupidest question of the day. Hey, Mandy, what's your experience of David Tennant and Catherine Tate? <laughs> Doctor Who, of course. <laughs> Doctor 
Doctor Who. Exactly. <laughs> um, yes. I mean, that's that's how I know of them. Like, that was my introduction to both of them was Doctor Who, although I have since, you know, I've seen David Tennant and other things. I've seen Catherine Tate and a few other things. Um, I've seen her. She did. She was in the American version of The Office for a little while towards the end of that run. Funny story. Um, Joseph's son walked through while I was watching this yesterday and he looked at the screen and he goes, is that the lady from The Office? Nice. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I guess that's what you can call her. Um, and then I've seen her, like, her and David Tennant, like, host a lot of things together. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and so I've seen them do that, uh, which is fantastic. And I'm sure there are other things that I've seen them in. But, I mean, it all comes down to Doctor Who. Have you seen Christmas at Nan's? No. Oh, you need to go find that on YouTube. It is absolutely glorious. I've not even heard of that. Is that a That's a not the Christmas TV? Carol adaptation, is it? I think it is. Yeah, because he comes in as the ghost of Christmas past or something. Okay. And he's like wearing the ridiculous rig. If you've ever seen the gif of, of David Tennant wearing that ridiculous black like wig and jumping up and down and going, risotto, 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 risotto. That's that's from that. I have not seen this, but now I have to go find it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, are they destined now to be casting things together forever? Yes. Oh, I hope so. Hmm. Oh, I'm, I'm also very familiar with this. I don't even know what show they did it for, but Catherine Tate can't be bothered. What is it? Are you the doctor? <laughs> doctor Who. I don't know what you're talking about. You look like Doctor Who, though. I'm not Doctor Who. I'm your English teacher. I don't think you are, though. Lauren. I think you're a 945-year-old Time Lord. Listen. (laughs) Did you just pitch up from Mars? Don't be ridiculous. You know your house, right? What? You know your house? Yeah. Is it bigger on the inside? Be quiet. If you park the TARDIS on a meter. (laughs) Can we please get back to Shakespeare? Thank you. So... Do you fancy Billy Piper, sir? Right. <laughs> you are the most insolent child I've ever had the misfortune to teach. Thank you. You're pointless, repetitious, and extremely dull. A bit like Shakespeare. <laughs> oh, yes. Mm. But he's the teacher. Oh, that was a Red Nose Day thing. Was that what that was? Yeah, yeah I've yeah. seen that. And that, that's a gift like that. forever, so... She she became famous over here doing a uh, sketch show, which I think was ah. the Catherine Tate show, and that's one of her characters that they then oh, wheel okay. out every so often. Um, Mandy, you mentioned that you'd studied other Shakespeare. Mm-hmm. Is it just those three you've studied? Are you aware of any other Much Ado adaptations? Well, I know that there's the Joss Whedon version from 2012, which, because Joss did it, I was always interested in watching it. It was kind of always on my radar. Um, but again, nobody was holding my hand through that one. So I (laughs) kind of like kept looking at it like one day I'll do that one day. Um, and, uh, one of my friends from college, her favorite Shakespeare is, is much ado about nothing. And so she talks about the Kenneth Branagh version all the time. Um, but I haven't seen it obviously, but I know it's there. Okay. It's good to know the existence of things in the world. (laughs) (laughs) And, and I think for full disclosure, we're not watching them this time because I think we're going to have a conversation about the play, a conversation about this adaptation. It would be a lot of conversation to have the others in there as well. I mean, I'm up yeah. for a four hour podcast if you are. <laughs> <laughs> I did hop on YouTube and watch a few clips of the Joss Whedon one oh, uh, man, before they. we recorded today. <laughs> um, just because I wanted to see, I mean... Maybe this can be part of the conversation that we have, but there were a lot of things in this adaptation that were very, very specific to the style of David Tennant and Catherine Tate. Oh, yeah. Like, when those two get together, like, you kind of know what direction some things are going to go, regardless of the topic. And so I was curious how other people do those things. Hmm. Uh, which is why I pulled that one up, and I didn't think to to see if I could find clips of the Emma Thompson, Kenneth Branagh one, but yeah. Very different. Okay. 
So having now seen it and, and experienced Much Ado About Nothing, did you enjoy it? Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I have laughed that much while watching a movie in a very long time. Yay! Mm-hmm. Like, it was ridiculous. I was sitting there, like, giggling to myself, and then I was, like, cackling and, like, clapping my hands. And, <laughs> like, I was very self conscious because there was a 15 year old teenager in the house who <laughs> was not interested at all in Shakespeare, but was hearing me do this while watching Shakespeare. Yeah, I, it, yeah, it was a thing. Well, maybe you're, you're piquing their interest through just being excited. <laughs> maybe. Fingers crossed. It was utterly ridiculous, <laughs> but it was so much fun. Can you separate the two actors that you love and adore from the story? Did the story do it for you? Or, or is, it, is it the fact it was them that made it so much better? I think it's both. Um, but I think it's good that I saw this version first. Because I'm not sure I would have been quite as enamored with the source material if I had seen one of the other versions first. Okay. I could be wrong because, like I said, I haven't seen the other versions and I've only seen a few clips of, of Joss's. Um, but I think it helped that I was predisposed to like it because of David Tennant and Catherine Tate. Um, but the story itself, um, God, I thought it was brilliant. And it was this. <laughs> I mean, it's Shakespeare. Of course, it's brilliant. And of course, <laughs> you know, Shakespeare was a man before his time. Like, we all know that. But it was so apparent watching this that there was just so much stuff going on that you don't think about happening in the 16th century oh yes i do love all of the little bits like with hero and the the margaret the serving lady and all of those kind of things like oh my gosh i didn't i guess they would have been doing that back then too huh right (laughs) and there was just so much sarcasm in it and then when you go back and look at the text and you're like yeah, that's actually written sarcastically or in a joking manner or some kind of like dry humor. Um, and you just forget that that kind of thing was around because <laughs> we think we invented humor, you know? It's very true. Yeah, I love that it can swing so wildly from the, the certainly the first act of huge humor, lots of banter, lots of things back and forth, the, the overhearing and gossiping sequences into some really dark, serious places. Yeah. Yeah. The the dark and seriousness, like, I really enjoy some of it. Um, but every time, especially when it gets put into a modern setting, I really get just irritated that they're like, she's dead. And you're like, oh, my gosh, feel for a pulse. Come on. Like, <laughs> uh, back in the day. Yeah, that is, that is pretty fair. <laughs> yeah, I, I had made a note in, in this one in particular that... The Benedict after the the wedding scene and the Benedict from before that were basically two different characters. Mm. Yeah, and I'm I'm still like mulling that over in my head. Is does that irritate me because I think it's like breaking the character, or is that really a realistic thing that that somebody could go from being that silly to being that serious over such a serious situation? Um, and I. I'm not sure how I feel about that right now. I just made the observation that it seemed odd. It's always interesting to me how the different versions of it play that change because it has to happen. Like the the way the play progresses, you have to have funny, bantery, whatever first act. And then you have to have him serious enough to be able to actually confront Claudio. But some of them, it is more diametric. And I think this one was a little bit harsher of a change because he was so over the top silly previously. I mean, like the paint scene was just (laughs) glorious. And I Mm. love his little dancing and all of that. But like because it was so, 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 so over the top that when you get to the parts where he has to be focused and serious and take you know, take Beatrice, even though she's being over the top, dramatic, like, seriously, get over yourself. But (laughs) that's the way it's written. And I think Tennant does a really good job of going to the serious side. And I, I mean, I've seen that elsewhere, too. But with this one, when he goes serious, it's just like, oh, oh, stuff's gonna go down. This is gonna be bad. 
Yeah, you you kind of get notes of that dark doctor that that we saw in in Doctor Who because David Tennant can God he can go from silly to scary mm. in like five seconds flat, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and he definitely used that uh, in this performance. I like that he plays it. Certainly, the the early sequence is so broad. It's not necessarily that he hates women. He just acts up everything that he talks about and likes having the banter and the back and forth. And he's, you know, in the golf cart, gesticulating wildly and talking about <laughs> having an epitaph hung on him and so on. But then it really, the the performance gets much quieter when, when you have the turn of him both confronting Claudio and finally being in love. He's much more devoted to her. He's not doing the, the playing for everyone else. He's doing it all for him now. It's really nice. He is clearly the best actor in this. I <laughs> could gush about it quite easily. Um, but his, his delivery is just so good. There, there are times with oh, all the plays, um, but even some of the people in this, you can see they're kind of reading lines, mm-hmm. but he's taken the delivery and made it his own, and it's part of the conversation and the back and forth. Yeah. I think you really see that even when he's monologuing. Like he's oh, yeah. He's talking to the audience, and you can see it. And Mm -hmm. even though normally, like, during a a stupid soliloquy, like, I love Hamlet, but, you know, the to be or not to be, it can be so poorly done that you're just like, okay, yeah, I know, I get it, you're depressed, shut up, move on. (laughs) But (laughs) Tennant makes those monologues, he takes them, he turns it into, like, audience participation, almost. And the way he he speaks them and he makes them his own and he's not afraid to pause and he's not afraid to to do all the really good actory things that you should do. Right. And I love him for it. Yeah, I think my favorite one, I mean, he had so many, but my favorite one that really stood out to me, and it's because I I had the play open and was following along with the play while I was watching it. Because oh. sometimes they were talking so fast. You know, that it, it just kind of helped me keep everything together. Sure. And when you're actually reading the words, like, Shakespeare and punctuation aren't great, you know? Right. And, and so in right after um, the scene, this like, the, the monologue he has right after he's been tricked, like, he's been overhearing the conversation they have about Beatrice loving him, he has a line that in the play, the words are, love me, exclamation point. Why, comma, it must be requited. But he said, Love me. Why? (laughs) It must be requited. But he took that why and made it like, why on earth would she do that? Yeah. And it would never have occurred to me from reading it, just the text on the page, to do that. But watching him perform it like that, it was hilarious. It made perfect sense and it fit. And I loved it. And he did that over and over and over again. And Beatrice, too. Um, she does a lot of the same kind of ownership of some of those lines, especially like the banter at the very beginning when she's mm-hmm. going back and forth with Leonardo. Like, I've seen versions of it where there's like, I, I'll, I'll eat his kill and they... They don't play it up as much as a joke. And you're like, I pray you, how many hath he killed and eaten in these wars? <laughs> but how many hath he killed for indeed I promise to eat all of his killing? Wait, is she like a cannibal? Like, what is up with this girl? <laughs> <laughs> but I think Catherine Tate does a good job of putting enough sarcasm and enough very, very obvious, like, just disdain in everything mm-hmm. she says that it really makes those lines that much funnier. And I really adore her for it. Yeah, I think in that in that same scene, she was talking about, I, I actually have this in my, my favorite lines because it's a great moment from the play itself. But she's talking about, you know, men and men who has a beard is more than a youth and he that doesn't have a beard is less than a man. And then she ends it with, and he that is less than a man, I am not for him. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and I just cracked up. Like her facial expression, the way that she said it. Um, yeah, so she did the same thing. She did it less than David Tennant did. Yeah. She relies much more on physical comedy than he does. It's true. I think in, in a lot of the stuff that she does, um, 
And a lot of it is stuff that I love about her jumping up and down and flailing and over enunciating. Mm -hmm. Like, do not you love me? (laughs) You know, and just like drawing words out. And he is much more subtle in the things that he does. But when you put them together, it's fantastic. Well, and in the one scene where there's the, uh uh-oh, which character is it that proposes to her? Oh, the Don, the prince. Thank you. The prince Mm. says, would you have me? (laughs) Like, in so many adaptations, you just see, like, oh, no, your grace is too lovely. And they're very, like, very nice about it. And she just, like, over the top, obviously threw it in his face and then laughed so much. Will you have me? Lady. <laughs> no. <laughs> My lord. Unless I might have another one for working days. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and I really love that delivery because it's like that socially awkward moment of, mm-hmm. oh, I just did something really bad. Let me make up for that. <laughs> yeah. Like, I was literally clapping my hands and laughing during that scene. Mm. <laughs> I was and, very involved in, in this watch. <laughs> it's really nicely played from both sides because he's playing it serious. Yeah. And normally that's a bit of flirtation. It's like, well, you know, would you have me? You know, I'll be, you know, that's if it. we're not both married by the time we're 40 and so on. But he's actually like, I am willing, you know, if you were... And she's just like, yeah, no. <laughs> it's so good. Because both reactions work off each other really well. Mm-hmm. Um, and and then it does lend credence to the the bit at the end, get thee a wife. And that he's a bit sad because he's now the only single man. Right. Again, that, that doesn't always come through because it's all been played as jokey, fun, flirty all the way through. Mm-hmm. Um, Catherine Tate, exactly like you said, her expressiveness, her reaction to things and the way she, she enunciates everything. She, she is a very, very good Beatrice. Oh, yeah. You can feel that it's a character who has not had a good time with men in, in relationships, has found it difficult to meet someone that she likes or treats her well or something. And so has ended up with this armor and tackling everyone, even someone she might possibly be interested in. Mm-hmm. It, it really comes across well from her. Absolutely. I, I'm, I'm going to go into the bit that I feel like we might be about to fall out over. The, the, <laughs> the scene where she overhears Margaret and Hero talking about oh Benedict being in love with her. I was really disappointed because I was looking forward to seeing her expressions as she hears this and her reactions in the background. And She's under them a having. <laughs> well, exactly. It's just... You, you get nothing of it from her, where he gets to have all this fun, some of the slapstick comedy, but as well as giving the reactions, she is literally flaying around and being silly <laughs> in what to me is a slightly unrealistic way. Because at that point, slightly. they know she's there and she knows they she's there. I, I was really looking forward to seeing Catherine Tate get to deliver that. And that's one of the few scenes that they've made changes to and added that to that I've got, oh, I, it didn't work as well for me. But I think you both really liked it. No, to be honest, like out of the whole show, that is probably maybe not my least least favorite scene. But it is one that grinds my gears because I'm like, what is she doing up in the like? This is stupid. What are you doing? There's no way this is just an (laughs) accidental overhearing. Okay, so I am of two minds. One. I'm sorry. It was hysterical. I laughed (laughs) madly throughout the whole thing. When she went under that sheet, I thought, like, I had to pause it. I was laughing (laughs) so hard. But on the other hand, as a scene, it didn't work, like, for what they were trying to convey. I mean, with, with Benedict's scene, he was in the background. It was very clear that... That they knew he was there and they were moving to ensure that he could overhear them while also trying to pretend like they didn't know he was there. You know, it was very um, coordinated. And Catherine Tate's scene was just messy. Um, yes. I think, Matthew, you, you noted in your notes that really what you end up with is you end up with Hero and I, I think it was Ursula 
might have been Margaret. I can't remember which one it was. They're really just standing there trying not to look at her, shouting their lines to make sure that while she's flipping in the air, they can he- she can hear them. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I guess from a plot perspective, it really doesn't make sense. But I enjoyed the heck out of watching it. I did. Fair. Yeah, I can see it's funny. It just disappoints me a little bit. And and I think yeah. if they'd done it in such a way that she also got the paint on her. So and, and actually show these are the two people going through the same thing and, and you know, she gets paint on her and sits on her hand or something and gets it on a bum. You can do the same sort of gag slightly differently, so it's a bit different, but Yeah. Uh, I just I was looking forward to that, and I, I think I was looking forward to it because it's a very hard scene to do well because there's so much going on. Yeah. A- and one of the other versions does it so well. It's like, oh, this mu- this version must be really good as well. Yeah. And mm-hmm. uh, and again, David Tennant does it wonderfully. He gets to do so much through the whole thing. It's yeah. Great. I think I got the impression that they were actively trying to make it different yeah. than what mm. they did with David Tennant so that it wasn't just the same thing over again. And they played to Catherine Tate's strengths because she is such a physical comedy person. And so that's what they did with her. That makes sense. Um, And so it makes sense. It just doesn't work for the story, I think. Hmm. Except it did because it made me laugh. And I like to laugh. So, <laughs> well, we're all <laughs> like here I said, fun, I'm right? of two minds. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think they tried to tie it together by being like, oh, now the painters are painting higher, so they need this weird rigging thing. Mm-hmm. Like, they wouldn't just True. build a mm-hmm. platform or something, but whatever. Yeah. Such is the way you have to structure a play. Although, on on the the topic of the way they built their, their things, that spinning platform was amazingly used in so many of the scenes. Mm. I Definitely. I really, really enjoyed, um, especially like um, during the much later on the bachelor bachelorette party time when they were just like constantly spinning it, and you would see like something crazy is going on over here, something crazy is going on over here, and there's Don John being all like gross in the shadows. <laughs> Weasley, yeah, <laughs> yeah, Weasley. I really liked his portrayal too. Like, that's a hard part to play as well, mm. um, because there's so many times it either comes off as completely like I'm a huge weasel and I'm terrible and all of the evil things are going to happen, or it gets played like over the top, silly. I'm, I'm the dastardly. Like, I should have a mustache that I'm spinning in my absolutely, face. yeah. <laughs> and I've seen both, and yeah. I thought this was a nice kind of middle ground where he he looks a little sketchy but he's not like i'm not going to trust him at all you know hmm. yeah i don't know who that actor was but i thought he nailed the part like i i hated the character but i really liked the performance and you are supposed to hate the character so he did good yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah no he did absolutely and it, it made me happy that he just plainly stated i am a plain dealing villain <laughs> like <laughs> exactly like way to own your shit mm. that's exactly what he did it was great and, and exactly like you say kim it's nice because he's not mustache twirling <laughs> i'm going to be evil and villainous now which is the most obvious way to play it and i've seen that and it's disgusting absolutely yeah <laughs> um the bachelor bachelorette party <laughs> sequence is probably the best change to the whole thing yes the, the the mistaken identity of Hero and Margaret, the fact she's wearing a different wig, oh, and yeah. that's how he gets to see her. It's so much more natural than going to her room, Margaret dressing up as her, and then being taken. It, it's a lot more convoluted in the original. This, I think, it works to make it much more simple. I do too. I really enjoyed the way, and then like to have everybody completely like inebriated, and mm. you also get the choice of showing both Benedict and Beatrice as being like, "I'm in love. I shouldn't be at this party. I should be like sorting out my own feelings." You know, like you can kind of see their melancholy without it just being like. I think it's really only Benedict that has lines in that, isn't it? I don't think they really talk about Beatrice. Now that I think about it. No, I think she's just not in that sequence. Normally, yeah. Hmm. So, anyway, I really enjoyed the way they they change it up for the the stage play, and they utilize that that spinning set piece. Yeah, 
Mm. I, I think um, going back to just talking about how they structured it, um, like I said, I, I was following along with the play. And so I, I did get confused in a few bits and I had to scramble to find things because they changed the order of some of the scenes. Oh, yeah. Mm. Um, particularly the ones concerning the prince's watch. Um, and then there were also a lot of lines that were either completely cut or truncated. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And it worked, though. Like, I was surprised because usually whenever you see a stage adaptation like this, the words are completely faithful. It's how they choose to perform those words and what they do with the set and the movement that gets changed. And so it was interesting to me to see them rework the order and and figure out a way to tell the story in a way that flowed and still made sense or even made more sense since they put it in a modern setting. Mm. Yes, we had a question on Twitter, actually, from Agent Austin09, who asked what we thought of that modern setting for the play, and and does it work for us? It took me a little while to get into it. Initially, I was confused about when and where it was set, um, because that's not super clear. I mean, I don't know. Is it supposed to be 2011 Britain? I have no idea. Um, But eventually, I just kind of got into that zone where this is just how it is, and so that it was fine. I think I was kind of the same way, especially the first time I watched it, because I had only, I think I'd only seen like an actual stage play with the very like traditional garb and very Italy. Um, But Mm. then I had seen Bronick's version and his is all very traditional garb, very Italy, like rolling fields and and beautiful Mm -hmm. scenery. And coming to this one, it was like, wait, whoa, what? what are these weird Navy costumes and why is he had British right. flags all over his golf cart? Why is there a golf cart? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's not just me. That's exactly what was going through my head <laughs> during the opening scene. <laughs> like, I don't understand. But then I, I just kind of like went with it. And then after I was able to do that and stop questioning it, it was fine. It's true. And it gave you some different music choices, which are interesting like in the play themselves they are are useful and i think they are used very well for the different scenes like the parties where they're dancing and such um and of course the the end song the sign not so is stuck in my head for a month now because i absolutely <laughs> love it um but there's also a soundtrack that goes with this <laughs> And I was like, oh, I love that end song. I bet the rest of the soundtrack is fantastic. Don't do it. Don't. Don't. Oh, really? <laughs> oh. Don't. It's like all of the little snippets you hear, I think, must have been pulled from the soundtrack because I can hear it in the back. But when you listen to them on their own, they are the worst versions of 80s pop music ever. <laughs> <laughs> Except the end song. The Sign Not So is still fantastic. And David Tennant and Catherine Tate both sing in it. So, of course, like my heart melts every oh, time nice. I hear David Tennant sing. Yeah. But. Mm-hmm. Okay. The the setting is meant to be Gibraltar uh, in the 80s. So it's a kind of Falkland War era to give it uh, why they would be naval officers and actually fighting in this period. Ah. So it's still a Mediterranean setting uh, where it was Sicily previously. Well, that makes the boombox make a little more sense. Mm. And the Pipers... I really love that they adjusted the line <laughs> for the tape to be like, ah, let's get the Pipers. Like that was the name of the band or something. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that was brilliantly done. Very nice. I, I like it. I think it works nicely. I, it doesn't even feel strange that they're using this sort of uh, slightly antiquated language over the top of what's going on because it's such an accessible play and story it's still it's still just about people having witty barbs at each other and falling in love and falling out with each other it's true and i think this particular version makes it a lot more accessible partially because of some of the rearranging they've done i'm sure but just the facial expressions and the way they like we were talking earlier with the way david Tennant, like so just takes it and owns it and you Mm. can understand what he's saying even if he's saying like old english words you still comprehend what he means by them and i think they did a really good job of of increasing the accessibility yeah i definitely agree i mean like i said i came into this completely intimidated by the thought of doing shakespeare and 
from the moment it started, I was all in and completely engaged and completely involved in the story, not questioning what was happening at all. Oh, which is what I I expected to be confused and to be like, what are they saying? What does that mean? I think the only thing that I'm still not certain about, and I, I made a note of this in my notes, is in Shakespeare's time, did it mean something different to be called an ass? <laughs> that is the only part of Dog Fairy that I actually like. <laughs> <laughs> I hate him otherwise. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Okay. He's my least favorite character because he gets played terribly so often nathan fillion did an okay job with the joss whedon version oh, okay it, nathan fillion's probably the best part of the joss whedon version but oh wow yeah okay I, i'd agree <laughs> uh but a lot of times like he is just he's supposed to be over the top but they take it mm -hmm. to like 11 and it's disgusting and i hate it his character made the least sense to me in this version um because i just i didn't understand what the point of his character was really i mean i understand what the prince's watch was for but the way it was played in this version was confusing too over the top and confusing and like mm. you know the the picture of rambo on the the easel paper and just like when he he like at one point he raises his shirt and starts doing like this like hip twisty dance <laughs> thing and i'm like i don't really understand why you're doing that right now <laughs> He was trying to illustrate the words, but I, yeah, I get why you would be confused. Yeah, and then he just kept insisting that that people know that he's an ass, and I, I just I didn't know if that was supposed to mean something that I didn't understand, or if I was just supposed to accept it and move on. It, they, I think they're using it in terms of a donkey or a mule. He's not calling him a bottom. It's meant to be yeah. an insult, whatever it is. Mm. As far as his particular role in the play as a whole, he is supposed to be like the guy who is the head of the watch and so he's mm -hmm. really supposed to be in charge of like bringing in these knaves and getting all this together and of course the reason he acts so buffoonish in um the shakespearean play is to be kind of a, a red herring so that he can be the the one to be like hey i have the actual answer to what's going on here and then to have him be so stupid that Leonardo and the rest of them are just like go away stupid guy like I don't want to talk to you because you have mm -hmm. no idea what you're saying and I have more important things to deal with and to me it's almost like you took the village idiot and were like I don't know what else to do with you I don't really need protection right now so I'm gonna go put you on this watch and you can go like tell people what to do and you can feel important <laughs> right I I will admit I do find his bit to the prince where he does his whole moreover secondarily sixth and lastly thirdly and to conclude I do <laughs> quite like that I do too yeah <laughs> but I think certainly in this in this performance like you say he does it so big it, it, he is playing to the text rather than it being or oh, just part of the character. Yeah. That he thinks he's saying the right thing. He's doing it to be the funny man on stage, which there's a lot of other funny stuff going on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I did find it interesting that... So one of my pet peeves, and I think we've talked about this before, one of my pet peeves is false conflict, where <laughs> if if two <laughs> characters had just talked to each other, everything would be fine. And so what Shakespeare did in this play was he has all of these misunderstandings going on, but then you have, is it Boraccio? Mm -hmm. Like once he's caught, he just flat out says exactly what happened. Like he doesn't lie. He doesn't try to get out of it. He's just like, here's what I did. Here's why I did it. Hmm. And like, it was so interesting to me to have that like right in the middle of all of the chaos because it's like. It's super straightforward, but nobody knows about it. Mm -hmm. mm. And I I liked it, even though I didn't. Well, I think a lot of it for me is just like, it's Shakespeare. So even though I generally dislike the false conflict kind of things, it's Shakespeare. And he yeah. survives a lot on false conflict. And there's a lot of things in his plays where like Romeo and Juliet, they wouldn't be dead if they had just, you know, been able to talk to each other. 
Um, but when it comes to this play in particular, the whole thing is about like misunderstanding. And so I think right. for me, I can put aside that a little bit more because I'm just like, it's Shakespeare. They're funny. They're really witty. The The dialogue is so fantastic that I don't even care that it, like if Hero had just been able to be like, hey, Claudio, stop being a dumbass. and <laughs> Like, just listen to me. <laughs> I'm not lying to you. Yeah, I think I'm not trying to say it's a bad thing. I think it's a good thing that he did at least offer a straightforward explanation in the middle of it, even if nobody but Dogberry and the audience got to hear it. Fair. Yeah, there's especially the false conflict with uh, Don John first saying, oh, the prince actually loves Hero and trying to wind Claudio up there. And I'm always pleased they don't take that any further, that it ends up with them falling out and having to reconcile. But it's just, Mm -hmm. there's no point to it. And it's annoying. (laughs) But then when he plays his proper trick, um, and no one knows what's going on, and exactly like you say, it could be resolved by people actually talking to each other, particularly Margaret. Like, she doesn't actually say, oh, I did something bad here, guys. I'm really sorry. Please don't fire me. She just disappears from the play at that point. Yeah. I do enjoy uh, with this particular version that like they were out partying. And so therefore she maybe doesn't remember, Mm, you know, Mm. maybe none of them do. And maybe Hero herself is even like, I don't, I don't think I did anything like that last night. What? (laughs) What? Yeah. I got the impression in this adaptation that Margaret didn't know that this had happened. Um, I think because it wasn't her actually dressing up as hero and like pretending to be hero, like Baraccio just took the veil and put it on her and then she was doing her thing with him. Like I got the impression and maybe I completely misread it that she didn't realize that anything amiss had happened. Yes. And that is part of the reason I like this adaptation as much as I do. Because when yeah. they're all like dressed up in the room on the balcony in hero's clothing, it's like, well, obviously, come on, mm. right? Yeah, I hadn't even twigged on that, and it makes me like that middle sequence even more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I think the the only thing I really didn't like was well, okay, that's not true. I guess we're gonna probably talk about Claudio and <laughs> what he did. Uh, um, I, I have, have no time for Claudio <laughs> at all, but. The thing that bothered me the most was that, one, nobody actually asked Hero if she did these things. Like, they said, Details. you know, who was the man that you were talking to? And she's like, I wasn't. And that's it. Like, it it wasn't, I'm still a maid. Or, did you lose your virtue? You know, They didn't do any of that. And they just shamed her. Her dad wanted to, like, physically harm her because he believed them. And she never spoke up. Like, they did mention at one point, she doesn't deny it. But why? Like, if she had just said, you're stupid, I didn't do this thing, I don't know where you're getting your information, and then maybe they could have, like, pieced it together at that point, Yeah, it would have been so much better. But, of course, conflict for the, Mm. the story. Exactly. Do we want to talk Claudio? Do we have to? I hate Claudio. <laughs> I'm so mad that they still ended up together. Right? Like, lose that guy. Seriously. Right? Like, I understand that he was duped. Like, they lied to him. He legitimately believed that she did this terrible thing, which is 100% okay. It's fine to be angry when you think somebody's cheated on you. But for your first instinct to be I'm not going to confront you about it and make sure that I'm actually understanding what I think I'm understanding. I'm just going to shame you in front of your entire friends and family in a church. Mm. And then when you, quote unquote, die, die, I'm going to laugh. But then when you're not really dead. No, no, no. Wait, hang on. Then when I realize that you didn't actually do the things that I thought you were going to do, I'll just marry your cousin because, you know, she's still in your family and it's just like you. But, oh, wait, it's really you. So let's get married. I, I don't have time for that. No. I, I agree 100%. And that's probably the biggest flaw in this play in general is always the Claudio hero subplot. Like, they're always madly in love. And hero, 
I really want to see a version of this play where Hero is like, no, you fool. I ain't going to marry you. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to run off with the prince. He needs a wife. <laughs> yes. Like, I think I... <sighs> I don't know. I think I had it in my brain at first that whenever Leonardo started talking about how he had another niece, um, my first instinct was, oh, are they going to try to pass Margaret off? And then I was like, oh, obviously, this is Shakespeare. They're just going to dress Hero up and surprise, she's not dead. You know, and so, like, I think my first instinct was give Margaret to Claudio. I don't care. And then let Hero go marry the prince. (laughs) And then we'll all live happily ever after. Exactly. I don't. I don't think they even need the lie about the niece. Just come, there is another girl to, for you to marry. But he spins it with so much detail. It's like, dude, you don't need it. Yeah. <laughs> this guy's yours now. Less details, easier to lie with. Come on. Mm. We all know <laughs> this, yeah. Um, there are two changes in this. Uh, two other changes that I wanted to mention. That uh, One I really like, one I don't like. And I wanted to ask your opinions on them. Um, the change... In the original text, Leonardo's wife is actually his brother. Um, and I really like that change. I think it works well. Yes. Because we have her reference in other places. And the other one is when he goes to Hero's tomb, he considers killing himself. And she appears to him and then he doesn't. And I don't like that. I don't like her appearing early. And I don't like him thinking about killing himself there. Uh, did either of you have reactions to those changes or those moments? I really like the change um, from, I guess, Antonio to Antonia. Mm. Yeah. I I don't know if they actually named her um, in this version, but that I liked because it it made so much more sense than for her to not be there Mm -hmm. and for her to be the one who had those speaking lines. Um, The other change, I guess I wasn't super aware that it was actually a change. So it's the only version I've seen. There you go. So don't have much of a comment. Yeah, okay. I, I have always thought that the thinking about killing himself part was super dark. I'm really not in it for like. I understand maybe people in Shakespeare's time were more melodramatic. I don't know. Maybe he was really depressed and just hiding it the whole time. Well, I think it was fueled by guilt because at that point he he understood that he drove her to the point where she died because of his shaming her over something that didn't actually happen. Um, and I th- I feel like that's what was fueling that. But for me, it's just always very startling to see a gun in Shakespeare. Well, that's true. <laughs> that I think that's the part that – I don't want to say bothered me because I really liked the guns in – Romeo and Juliet. Really? From when they were drawing their sword with a flipping gun in their hand, I hated that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but I was also like fourteen, so Fair. <laughs> it was Leonardo DiCaprio and Claire Danes. I liked everything about that movie. Um, and, and but when I saw this one, it was completely jarring. Like I did not expect it at all, especially since like the Navy folks had swords. Mm-hmm. You know, like Benedict had a sword on him. At the wedding. Um, And I'm pretty sure the prince and Claudio did too. And so to go from seeing swords, actual swords, to seeing a handgun in Shakespeare was just jarring. Well, and for me, for Claudio in particular, like, he's been a clot this whole time. Like, I just, it would be better if he had maybe actually done it, but (laughs) (laughs) that would have changed the ending and been a lot more dramatic. Uh, but mm. like he's just been so easily swayed by everybody's opinions and like every little thing you say is just it it hits him so hard. Like I guess I understand yeah. where that came from, but like he doesn't seem like the kind that's going to go that far, if that makes mm. sense. Mm. Anyway. I guess I can I can see it both ways, I think. But that is one one thing I kind of like about the progression of him and Don John and Don John being like at the very first party scene um, when Don John's all, hey, the, he's wooing Hero for himself. And you can see early on how easily duped Claudio is. 
I mm-hmm. I think that's the reason it's in there, even though it seems really stupid. Um, but I think it's in there so that you can see as a audience member, like Claudio's not the sharpest knife in the drawer. <laughs> that is true. And so when you get to the point where he's being duped about um, the whole rest of it, like it makes sense that he jumps in with both feet and just completely yeah. leaves her at the altar. Yeah, I think the characters of Claudio and Benedict are interesting next to each other because Claudio is not really his own person. Yes. He is what everybody tells him to be, essentially. Hmm. Um, and, and Benedict is almost to the other extreme. He is intentionally not what men are supposed to be. You know, he is intentionally, I'm not going to get married. I am going to hate women and I'm just going to do all these jokes. And I'm going to tell you that if you get married, you're stupid. You know, like he goes to the complete opposite end of that spectrum. And, um, I think it's, it's interesting because I feel like the story is trying to bring them both more center, but it works with Benedict and it doesn't work with Claudio. Fair. I can see that. Yeah. Even at the end, he's still being told, right, come and marry my niece. Mm -hmm. Um, And and this other girl as as penance. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. He still gets his happy ending and it's completely unearned. Mm. Um, But I feel like Benedict's is earned. And especially yeah. because what he should have learned is that Don John can't be trusted and is a you know plain dealing villain. So why the next time he comes to him, he's then like, sure, sure, John, whatever you say. Right. <laughs> At that point, he should be like, no, dude, you burn your bridge already. Right. <laughs> um, but he he's he's not a quick learner, he not a quick not. study at all. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so so that's the detail I want to dig into. Uh, if you either of you don't have any more talking points, I would like to hear your favorite things about this adaptation and about the story. I'll let you go first, Kim, because the, you picked this and you love it so much. <laughs> okay, so I have a lot, a lot, a lot of things I absolutely love about this. Um, uh, probably number one is David Tennant looks better in a mini skirt and and like midriff oh. top than any man has right to yeah. <laughs> or person has right to like i look at him in that outfit and i'm just like huh <laughs> that's amazing yeah. yeah my first reaction was oh my god is that david tennant in a mini skirt <laughs> and then i was like that's david tennant in a mini skirt <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> Oh my gosh, I love it so much. And he looks so good. So the costume designer in this, other than the wedding dress, did a really fantastic job. Because even like um, Beatrice in the same scene, like she's wearing like the 80s slouchy like suit thing with Mm -hmm. the weird boots. Like it totally Mm. works. And I love it so much. Yeah. They dressed Beatrice wonderfully. Like then uh, at the bachelorette party, she had the overalls with the shirt off the shoulders underneath Mm -hmm. it with the belt. And then she got that fabulous blue dress at the wedding. Mm. Oh, yeah. The the costume designer was like was awesome. So the costumes overall were one of my favorite points. Mm. Um, My second favorite point was the boy that like fetches the book and all that like he doesn't do a lot and I, I i don't think he maybe has like a line or two but they changed it so that he has like a subplot of solving a rubik's cube yeah <laughs> <laughs> and like the first time i saw it I, and he came out with a rubik's cube at the end i didn't even really notice it and then, i don't know the second or third time i've seen it i i was like oh it's solved at the end. That is so clever. <laughs> I did not notice that. Huh. Okay. I just, I kept wondering, why is this rando kid always showing up? Because, like, he did have the one line, and I'm pretty sure that one line is the only time that kid was in the play itself. Yeah. When he's like, In my chamber window lies a book. Bring it. Heather to me. I'm here already, sir. (laughs) 
I know that. <laughs> I would have the hens and here again. A book? A book. <laughs> <laughs> But then he just kept showing up, and I was like, okay. I just really love that they gave him a whole subplot. Like, that's just yeah, completely visual. And there's a lot of other visual things in the play that have nothing to do, but they really just use the physical pieces to either just expand a little bit, like with the paint thing, um, mm. you know, like that's not at all in the play, or... Um, the straw when he's first just waking up after the night of debauchery. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, anytime I can see David Tennant stick his tongue out and like try to, yeah, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So those are my, my three favorite Good pieces, stuff. I guess. All right. Yeah. I, I've mostly talked about all of mine. Um, Anything Catherine Tate and David Tennant in this. Um, I think Catherine Tate's reactions to things, not her line delivery specifically, um, but the things that she brought to it that weren't in the text when she would like jump up and down and flail her arms and just kind of be screaming out of excitement. Um, like when when Benedict told her that he loved her after the wedding, like her reaction to that was fantastic. Mm. Um, and And that was not part of the text that was something she brought to the character um and there were a few lines like just from the play itself it had some really amazing like, one-liners and, and like zings and stuff um and and so i think the ones that stood out to me um david Tennant recognizing why marriage is important and it's because the world must be peopled <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay that is an accurate statement right um and then when claudio is talking to him about um whether or not he should pursue hero and, and should fall in love and benedict is basically like do you question me as an honest man should do for my simple true judgment or would you have me speak after my customers being a professed tyrant to their sex no i pray thee speak in sober judgment why You know, he's like, do you really want an honest answer or do you want me to be this, like, male whore that, that people think that I am? <laughs> and I liked that um, because that's something God, we deal with that kind of stereotype today. Mm. You know, <laughs> like some things just never change. Um, and then I already talked about Beatrice's little speech about um, men versus youth. Oh, yeah. Loved it. It was awesome. Yeah, all of my favorite things had to do with Catherine Tate and David Tennant, but I'm not really surprised about that. <laughs> they have a pretty big part of the story as well, so pretty fair. <laughs> Just a little. Yeah. yeah. I love Beatrice's, the, the sort of two introductions to her. First of all, her sparring with the messenger. Oh, yeah. Uh, and then her sparring with Benedict when he finally turns up. It Just, it has me legitimately laughing out loud. It is so good. Her thing about... I had rather hear my dog bark at a crow than a man swear he loves me. It's just the most ridiculous line, <laughs> but it's so good. Yeah. And even before Benedict is there to, to back himself up and, and to have a go at her, she's still putting him down to everyone, her whole... And a good soldier too, lady. And a good soldier to a lady. <laughs> But what is he to a lord? A lord to a lord. A man to a man. Stuffed with all honourable virtues. It is so indeed he is no less than a stuffed man. <laughs> but for the stuffing, well, we are all mortal. Oh, he's a stuffed man. <laughs> wink, wink. <laughs> That's one Should of my we... favourite lines for the whole show. It's wonderful. And that, the the constant play on words throughout about who is stuffed. And then when she's full of a cold and she's stuffed, and the, the other women are like, oh, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as much as it's all about virtue and chastity and all that, there's a lot of good body humor going on. Oh, yeah. And they repeatedly did the play on Benedict's name. Mm. Like, Benedict. Dick. Dick. Yeah. 
Like, I caught on that that pretty early on. Oh, and then like, she's ill and she has to be cured by having the Benedictus, which is an actual yes. cure. To, oh, it's so good. <laughs> <laughs> like, it, it, did he give him that name all the way through for that joke? Because it's great. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly, yeah. Oh, I love it. It works very well. Also, I just realized in my notes, I, I have one other thing that I really liked. Mm, go on. Um, when Tennant professing his love, the, the first wedding, when Hero's shamed, and his super serious, like, I do love nothing in the world so well as you. <laughs> oh, there went my ovaries. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Oh, another one that he did, uh, and this was an addition to the text. You know, he's kind of reciting back to himself that she's wise, she's fair, whatever. And then the color, I mean, the line is supposed to be her hair shall be of what color it please God. Mm. He says, and her hair shall be red of what color it please God. (laughs) And I loved that moment. It's very nice, yeah. <laughs> he did some really good stuff mm. with, with the text. I mean, it, it's good stuff. And and uh, particularly him, but in general throughout this, they give it room to breathe. They can deliver lines and don't necessarily, it's just into the next line. And because it's all written and we know it so well, you just go through it. They actually mm-hmm. try to perform it, have it as a conversation. Yes. It's very well done. I think that's part of the reason it is so accessible is they do turn it into conversation as opposed to lines that you're reading from a page. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because so often what you get with Shakespeare is you just get Elizabethan words and then more Elizabethan words. Mm -hmm. And they're all strung together. And there's no inflection. There's no tone. Like, you don't read sarcasm as sarcasm. Um, and, And in part, I think that's... And I could be wrong on this. This is part of my Shakespeare's intimidating thought process. But some of that is because Shakespeare's England is largely unknown to us Mm -hmm. as as people who aren't historians, you know, and so we don't know what he was going for. And so it's easier to just read the words that are on the page. And then you get master actors who take it and they actually turn it into something that has meaning. And you don't always get that in Shakespeare adaptations. I mean, I can think of some that I've seen, particularly of Hamlet, that that do (laughs) terrible Mm. um, at that. Um, And and then whenever you see somebody do it so well, it's the difference of night and day. Like it changes your whole perspective of what the the story is about. Whenever you see somebody do that, I think being prepared to actually adapt it like you say to truncate parts to move things around to make changes to it that's the big thing the people who just deliver it as is by rote oh no yeah <laughs> um my absolute favorite bit the uh, it's particularly of the writing because it's just the funniest line and then because the line itself is so funny every time it's delivered it's always funny right at the very end it's all going to turn out happily they're all going to rush and have a wedding and it's all going to be fine beatrice says to benedict will you go to hear the news and his whole thing is i will live in thy heart die in thy lap and be buried in thy eyes and moreover i will go with thee to thy uncle <laughs> and it's written he knows what he's doing he knows he's being funny so any actor who comes to it is going just run at that and deliver it as funnily as you can it's wonderful yeah it's good great all right well is there anything else that we need to discuss about shakespeare's much ado about nothing i have two questions for you Oh, I have the same question about two things. Uh, There are two bits of the play that are often interpreted slightly differently in different adaptations, and I'd like to hear how you feel they did it in this. Uh, The first is at the party when they have the masks on and Benedict puts on the accent. Benedict, what is he? (laughs) What is this? Um, Do you think Beatrice knew it was Benedict? And then do you think this Beatrice and Benedict had had a previous relationship? 
Uh huh. Yes. Beatrice 100% knew it was Benedict. Mm -hmm. I I always think that every time I see that scene because it's like he's so over the top and like there's not very many people at this party. So it's not like she can't, you know, just count out like, oh, obviously that's Claudio. That's, you know, Leonardo, whatever. Like, yeah. <laughs> at least I think so. I... I like the idea that she didn't know better, but I'm not actually sure because they did go out of their way to have that other scene where Ursula, I think it was Ursula, was saying that this other dude in the mask was her husband. And he's like, no, I'm not. And she's like, I know my husband. Yeah, you are. <laughs> I mean, they went out of their way to to put that in there. So it kind of makes you wonder she should have known, especially considering the, the banter that they have with each other. Mm. Like, they're very familiar with each other. Um, so contextually, yes, she probably did know. But I like the idea that she didn't and she was just talking shit about Benedict. <laughs> the stranger. To be fair, she was talking shit about Den Benedict at the very beginning. Mm. So yeah. that would not be out of her character. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, but do I think there was a previous relationship mm. between the two? I, I think there was one line in the play that hinted at that. Mm -hmm. But I don't think the way they played it lends credence to that. So I mean I don't I don't know what Shakespeare intended. It, it kind of feels like Shakespeare intended that maybe they did, but the way they played it in this adaptation felt like no, they didn't have a previous relationship in that way like they've just known each other for so long they've been doing this flirting banter for so long that they love each other they just don't know they love each other until they figure it out i mean somebody has to tell them but then they figure it out i i think i agree um there's definitely other adaptations i've seen where they make it very heavy like they are a couple and something happened and she's just really crabby at him about it um, but in this particular adaptation, it uh, I always hate that line. <laughs> it's one line yeah. <laughs> talking about a Jade's <laughs> trick, which, A, is inaccessible because we are a society in which Jade's trick doesn't mean anything really anymore. Mm. And B, um, it's the only line in the whole play. So there's no other anything that would make you think that they've had a previous Except for that one line. You can write a yeah. flipping essay on one line of a Shakespearean play. <laughs> and I've done it. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> I I really don't like the idea that they were previously entwined. I think I like to interpret it that she's known somebody else that he has done that with. And so then she knows that story and says, oh, I know you. You treated floppied haired McFuzela over there so poorly <laughs> that I don't want to have anything to do with you. I like that explanation of it actually because I, I always come to it thinking they have had something but yeah in this they didn't go that direction or didn't feel it. Hmm, I like it. Yeah it doesn't honestly it doesn't make sense to me that they would have had a previous relationship and also have had such surprise and struggle with the idea that they loved each other now. Hmm. Because the particularly the way it was played, and, and I'm not sure if I'm unable to separate the specific words with the way that they performed the words. And so it, it may just come down again to this particular adaptation. But, like, I mean, Benedict's like, why would she love me? You know, and and Beatrice is like, this doesn't make any sense. Like, we fight all the time, you know. And, and if they had previously had a relationship, then those responses would have been different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the line that always makes me think they have is that thing of... You have lost the heart of Signor Bennett. Uh, indeed, my lord. Mm. He lent it me a while, and I gave him use for it. It implies that there was something, but that's about it, and it's not detailed enough to really say. Okay. But it's Shakespeare, and who knows what he meant? It's 400 years ago. <laughs> True. <laughs> well, I think bottom line is 
Shakespeare's amazing. <laughs> David Tennant and Catherine Date Tate are more amazing, and everybody should go watch this version. Completely worth yes. getting yeah. onto digital yeah. theater just to find this one play. Yes, yes. absolutely. And, Do it. and subscribe. <laughs> If you if you subscribe, you get it for a month. If you rent it, you get it for forty eight hours from the moment you click the button. I wish I knew that before I clicked the button. Oh, <laughs> well, yeah, because I mean the price difference is what one pound? Uh, two pounds, I think it was. Two but... pounds. Yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> do that thing. I was like, okay, oh. I'll watch it tonight, and then I'll watch it later in the week again, and get really get into it. Nope, have to watch it now. No other time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it starts from when you click the button, not from when you click play. <laughs> yeah. Not like Amazon. Yeah. Awesome. We're spoiled. Yeah. We are. All right. Well, if you would like to join the conversation, you can use the hashtag PC Deprived on Twitter. And you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Eloquent Gushing. You can find each of us on Twitter. I'm at Mandy Kay. And I'm at Matthew Vose. Kim, thank you so much for recommending this and and coming on to talk about us, talk about it to us. Uh, it was really good fun and, and not an easy thing. So thank you so so much. Absolutely, I will join you again anytime. Yeah, I, I think there might well be scope for a couple more adaptations, maybe discussion of how they do separate from the story. Oh yeah, so we, we shall see if we can uh, dive into them sometime. Mm -hmm. Where are people able to find you and your shows on the internet? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at MetGirl, M-E-T-Z-G-I-R-L. And then I am on Service Desk, which is my podcast about tech things, trying to explain the complicated tech world to people who don't understand technology. You can find that at Service Desk Pod. And I'm also, uh, the D&D &D podcast I am on is called Beholder's Eye which is the giant green eye on a black dice. And that's at Beholder's Eye Pod on Twitter as well. And then I'm also, you didn't probably know this, but I stream a D&D game on Twitch as well over oh. at Welcome Party RPG that you can also find on Twitter and link from there to the Twitch site. Awesome. All the stuff to go and find. I, I really enjoy Service Desk Pod. It's so accessible. It's good fun. I have a question for you, Ken. Okay. Have you tried turning it off and then on again? <laughs> I do so frequently. <laughs> and I actually, The IT Crowd is a show that I tried to watch when I very first got into tech stuff. And I just couldn't. Like, the humor was not oh. my thing. And so mm. since I have been in this tech area for a while now, I have had people be like giving me that quote, like, every day of my life mm -hmm. <laughs> oh i'm so sorry i did that to you <laughs> no i love it uh i got back <laughs> into watching it and now i there was like one episode where they like took a prostitute to the park or something and i just like i couldn't after that and so then after people kept hounding me about it i went and actually started watching it again so i am thoroughly enjoying the show thank you okay <laughs> I'm like you, it hits a little close to home at times. Yeah. <laughs> although, although it is completely bang on the whole football thing, because that's exactly what I do. Oh, yeah, that guy with the thing. Sports ball. <laughs> 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 Pop Culture Deprived is 100% funded by our wonderful listeners on Patreon. Anything you can give gives access to exclusive content and helps to support the network and develop new shows. If you want to find out more, please visit patreon.com slash eloquentgushing. And don't forget to subscribe to the newsletter on eloquentgushing.com to keep up to date with the latest news and announcements. We'll be back next week with another episode of Pop Culturally Deprived, where we'll talk about hackers with Tim Bat from the Little Empire Podcast Network. Until next time, I'm Andy Kay. And against my will, I am sent to bid you come in to dinner. Pop Culturally Deprived is an Eloquent Gushing production. For more information, go to eloquentgushing.com or find us on Twitter at Eloquent Gushing.